Dr. Matt. Thank you, Richard. I have the honor of being the anchor leg in this morning's uh, marathon, so what a wonderful suite of uh, pres presenters we've had this morning. I think there's a, there are a number of common messages. Uh, one of them, though, is that it's not enough anymore just to be right. We have to be effective. And we have to be more effective at communicating what we know and how well we know it to people who make decisions. And those people who make decisions include producers, they include policy makers, they include retailers, and they include consumers. One of the challenges we have when we talk about sustainability is it's so big, it's so integrating, so complex, there's a tendency to be hand wavy about it. Carl indicated that, uh, that sometimes everything's a priority. Well, if everything's a priority, we know that nothing is a priority. So this has been the, really the focus of my work for the last decade, is sorting out this process of being more effective at motivating decisions when we know the best possible strategies for doing so. One of the challenges we always have when we, when we work with um, complex stakeholders is that communications aren't easy. As you heard in the introduction from Richard, I work with a number of folks from a number of disciplines. So I work with architects. I'm an engineer. I think working with another a, a colleague in a design community like architects would be easy. It's not. Their language is different than mine. Now think about when I work with environmental groups and their language is different than mine. And think about when I work with farmers and when I work with legislators. I testified before the, the Senate's Committee on Agriculture last December. And the language I had to use there had to be very carefully selected because I'm dealing with a very charged issue, the, the um, management of waste in water in agriculture. So as we start thinking about these issues, I want you to understand that framing our communications is important. How many of you are scientists in this room? All right, good fair number of you. How many of you are uh, extension agents? How many of you deal with the public directly, the farmer community, producer community directly? How many of you deal with uh, grantsmanship, you have write proposals, right? So this is, this is a pretty familiar family communications group we have here. We're all in this together. We've been doing this for a while together. I can tell you that we've got to get better at our communications and better at our framing. So I'm going to start this discussion this, as we anchor in this afternoon with framing. And I know that as I walked up, I heard the, the stomachs of those of you from the East Coast grumbling because lunch is imminent and you're, you're about three hours past your feeding time. So uh, we'll get on with this. First of all, everything is connected. We've seen this diagram presented in a number of ways. World Wildlife Fund presents these, the, the three domains of sustainability in this nested Venn diagram as opposed to overlapping. And I think this is the better way to frame this. You cannot have a viable economic domain without a viable social domain. You just cannot. And you cannot have a viable social domain without a viable ecosystem. You just cannot. If you don't believe me, look at examples where any of those domains have failed and tell me if the others succeed. I'm a, a grandchild of the Dust Bowl. I can tell you when the, the agroecosystem fails, the social domain and the economic domain fail. If you want to know about the social and economic domain relationships, look at any war zone. They are fully interconnected and they're fully interdependent. We have to frame our message understanding that they are not separate systems. And everything is changing. We saw that from the very first pre presentation this morning all the way through. And that rate of change is accelerating beyond anything that we have ever experienced as a people. And we're all in this together. And trust me, we are all in this together more than we've ever been because there are more of us and we know everything instantaneously. Whether it's right or wrong, we know it and we know it right now. And let me tell you, it's not just us that know this. The, greatest, the fastest sales for this technology, cell phone technology on the planet are occurring in Africa and China. Despots know this too, by the way. Now, when we talk about everything is connected, this is the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report summary diagram showing that ecosystem services come from the land. It's important for us as we start our discussion with multiple stakeholders to frame our discussion in a place where we have common agreement. I love this diagram because it points out very clearly that all the things we care about, constituents of well-being, security, basic material for good life, health, good social relationships, freedom of choice and action, come from the land. Every farmer knows this. Every agricultural producer knows this. 
It's important to start with where we agree. Uh, Dale Carnegie said this in 1932, how to win friends and influence people. It was true then, it's true today. You start with your points of agreement, not with your points of disagreement. You don't start with climate change is a real and you don't believe it, you're an idiot. Not a good way to start a conversation. There are a number of versions of that. Let's also talk about this issue of population because one of the drivers of change, as we'll see, is population growth. We know this. My friend and mentor, Norman Borlaug, who I got to know very closely in my time at Texas A&M before he retired from public life, told me on a number of occasions, he said, look, I got into this not to feed the world, but to reduce human suffering, to increase human prosperity, to free humanity from the tyranny of starvation. That was his life's goal. And he told me on a number of occasions, I've watched my life's work devoured by the population monster. He said when he won the no accepted the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 in his acceptance speech, and I'm paraphrasing because I'm not as eloquent as him, he said, I did not, we have only won a battle against hunger. The war against population rages on. Population growth rages on. He said the best birth control is prosperity. If you want to reduce population growth, give people prosperity, and the best way to give humanity prosperity is prosperity from the land. That's what we do. That is our global challenge. That's our global opportunity. We frame our discussion from this point. Population increases without, with current fertility rates are going to hit 12 billion in 35 years. 12 billion. Well, population growth rates are coming down, and we know that they're probably going to be more like nine and a quarter billion with some uncertainty. The recent recession, global recession, has bumped this number up. We'll probably hit 10 billion by 2050. This is our management point, folks. I'm an engineer. I manage towards endpoints. That's our management point. 2050, 35 years, 10 billion people. Seven and a quarter billion people on the planet now. We got three billion more people coming to dinner in the next 35 years. We'd better understand how to feed them without eating the planet. And that's where we start to find common cause with people. And as I, so one of the things to consider, though, is what we do in the next 10 years to, re, to increase human prosperity will affect that number. We have a narrow window because the, the women who will bear the children that will determine what that number is will be born now over the next 10 years. And what we do now for their prosperity, for their independence, for their education, will determine where we are as a species in the next 35 to 100 years. I also suggest to you that when technologies and cultures collide, technology always wins. It may take a little bit of rumbling, but technology always wins. Those folks who are coming to dinner aren't going to be from around here. So if you're in the business of packaging stuff up and selling it to people, and your business model is based upon expanding sales, you're not going to do it if you're focused in the global north. You have to be selling elsewhere. A prosperous humanity is the, is the essence of our economic system. The good news is never have more people been as prosperous as they are today, and the better news is never will more people ever be more prosperous than over the next 35 years, and we have the opportunity to create an era of human prosperity from the land. We have that opportunity. We have that opportunity if we understand the context of our change. So I'm framing this message in a very positive way. Why? Because gloom and doom does not convince people to, that there's an opportunity for action. It, people disengage with death and, and dis, dismay. It is important that we understand that we have a positive message to tell for agriculture and for human prosperity. The challenge is complexity. People don't understand complexity well. They don't deal with it well. They disengage. We are in the great era of the great acceleration where we've seen greenhouse gas concentrations increasing climate impacts increasing, ocean impacts increasing, uh, terrestrial impacts increasing, driven by a number of forcing functions, so economic growth, human prosperity is increasing, water resource and ag development in order to feed those folks. Now that water resource development that we see, including the land grab from Africa and other issues, also means that more people have access to fresh water. 3,100 children will die today due to preventable waterborne disease more than all the people who were killed in 9-11 by attacks on, from terrorists on us will die today due to preventable waterborne disease. That's, to me, an urgent call to action. Agriculture, by bringing water to communities for, for irrigation, also brings, uh, reduces economic scarcity of water. It's a positive message. Prosperity consumption. That means people are choosing better things to eat. They're not just eating what's available. Eating more meat, good for animals. 
or animal production if you're an animal, it's not so good, I suppose. Global connectivity, as I showed you with the cell phone, we all know everything right now. Let's look at perhaps the other message. This is a message from the World Wildlife Fund, among others, that came out in November. The Living Planet Index, Species and Spaces, People and Places. 39% loss of terrestrial species in the last 40 years. 76% loss of freshwater aquatic species in the last 40 years. 39% loss of marine species in the last 40 years. What's the cause of this loss? Primary threats to uh, Living Planet Index populations come from over-exploitation, habitat loss change, and habitat loss, land use change, and extraction from wild. Those are the things that are killing species. Now what that means is we have common cause in agriculture when we are working to intensify production, to, in to increase yields from the land, we have common cause with conservation organizations who want to reduce habitat change, reduce uh, land use transformation, increase production, reduce exploitation of wild populations. We have common cause. That common cause is a unique opportunity for us to partner in this messaging process. So now we can move away from the old arguments of agriculture's bad, conservation's good. And we can start understanding that we're in this together, folks. Because, as we saw earlier, we're already using 43% of Earth's, Earth's terrestrial landscape for agricultural production when you include, include grazing and pasture land. There's just no more land left unless we start moving into other uh, ecosystems. So what are our key challenges? Well, in order to meet the projected demands for food, we're going to need to double yields in the next 50 to 100 years. I mean, 50 to 100 percent in the next 40 years. That means we've got to double yield on the land now in the next 40 years. If global production is not increased, if we don't do this around the world, then we're going to have to do it in the global north even more. If we want to preserve biodiversity and other land based ecosystem services, we have to freeze the footprint of agriculture. Freezing the footprint of agriculture is the phrase the World Wildlife Fund uses. Thus, yield must more than double in the next 40 years in the U.S. and Europe. Energy scarcity, as we've discussed, will drive innovation, but water scarcity will limit productivity. Those are our challenges. Jason Clay of the World Wildlife Fund says that there are persistent issues in sustainable agriculture and there are important issues. The persistent issues are locally grown, GMO crops, organic crops, natural, you could add a whole list of others, right? But the important issues are water use efficiency, soil erosion, soil organic carbon, land use change, biodiversity loss. These are indicators, these are metrics, these are ethics. Never, ever, ever argue a belief system with someone if you want to have a meaningful discussion. How many of you have had a religious argument lately? How many of you have had an argument over religion with your family? Uh, how many, Easter's coming up, right? How many of you have won those arguments? If you have, I want to talk to you afterwards because it's never been effective for me. You can't start a discussion based upon beliefs. We have to work for areas and points of agreement. So I've been working with a number of sustainability initiatives, and there are lots of them, field and market, uh, the, the FAO Sustainable Assessment of Food and Ag, Stewardship Index, uh, United Nations Solutions from the Land, Sustainability Consortium, of course, some retailer-driven initiatives. And what we've, what we've discovered is that we, in order to have a communication about priorities, stopping the 50 to 75 priorities all at once, we have to have a framework for continuous improvement. So we've developed a framework uh, that I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing with you, actually, the rest of our time. This framework is a, a common process, and I explain this to farmers in Iowa, they get it. I explain this to CEOs uh, in Northwest Arkansas and in Europe, they get it. This is not hard for people to understand. This continuous improvement framework is a process, simple process of defining, measuring, and implementing, iteratively getting things better. Define sustainability, define key performance indicators, select the metrics for those key performance indicators, and we have a number of those already. Benchmark those, LCA, as you saw from Al's presentation, is a great way to benchmark these. Set goals, setting the goals is tricky, we'll talk about that. Develop strategies to meet those goals, and we saw a number, Carl presented a number of opportunities for improving bench, uh, indicators in manure management. Implement the strategy, measure, assess, and report. Transparency, transparency, transparency. Communicate, adapt, when, admit when you fail, admit when it didn't work, 
adapt and improve. I think that may be my phone causing the buzz. So here's one of the challenges we have, though. If we, if we select a key performance indicator, uh, and zero is bad, 100 is good, and we move from some point over time to some other point over time, is that buzz bothering you guys? OK. Good, we'll, we'll pr pursue. If we have some benchmark, if, if we have some benchmark period, um, and we, we assume that, that we want to get better from some benchmark period, this is continuous improvement. However, if we have a certification protocol, and we've seen a number of proliferated certification protocols, what they do is accept, they develop some static minimum acceptance performance level. That minimum acceptance performance level is static, and maybe you can have silver, gold, and platinum, standards, but still, it doesn't make things better. Do you want me to swap? All right. And for the floor show, oh, that's going to really squall at him unless we turn this one off. Check, check. I'll have to move off the stage because I did learn about feedback mechanisms. All right, you guys can still see me here, assuming this works, this will work. Um, so minimum acceptance performance levels give us, uh, are, are not the solution for continuous improvement. What we need are continuous improvement strategies that allow us to move beyond certification protocols. Because site certification approach, farm level certification, in my assessment, will never work. Now farmers choose to pursue farm level certification for whatever thing, hallelujah. Anyone who can make a living from the land is a hero to me. And if you can get a premium for your crops, yeah, it's even better. And in some places, like, like uh, California and Colorado, there are different cropping systems than we have access to in Arkansas that really make a premium. So as long as it's legal and you can make a premium from it, hallelujah. Some of the initiatives we've been working with at the University of Arkansas included U.S. Poultry, National Institute of Animal Ag, the Pork Checkoff Group, University, or United States Soybean Export Council, Rice Federation, Peanut Council, Cotton Incorporated, Dairy Center. A number of these organizations were trying to de develop this process so that we have a harmonized method with harmonized uh, terminology, an ontology, if you will, so that when we say something, we understand what each other are talking about. And because the other real reality is there are no soybean farmers only in the United States. You're a soybean, cotton, and corn farmer in the United States. It's often the case that we need integrated systems so our producers do not have to have 50 different processes to engage in in order to uh, document their, their success. So one of the organizations that I've been honored to work with, I'm on the board of directors of Field to Market, uh, the Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture. Been at this about eight years, almost a decade. Uh, and what we've been working on, this is fuel, uh, this is agronomic crops predominantly, with potatoes added recently. And what we've been working on, it's a multi-stakeholder initiative, is defining key performance ind indicators. Now we have academics here, we have federal government here, we also have crop re uh, grower representatives, we have ag integrators, uh, we have, uh, and we also have conservation organizations at the table. The goal of this multi-stakeholder initiative is to come to common understandings on priorities, to get to Carl's point that we need to stop, to stop trying to do everything at once because we we're only really good at three or four things at a time, at best. My position is that you should never have more than five key performance indicators that you're working on at any given time because anything more than that is confusing to people. So pick the most important things first, and as you get better at those, you can move on to the next. If they're not the most important things, don't work on them. Seems empty, easy enough, but it is difficult to implement. You need a process to come to agreement. Now, we developed a, a, a definition in field to market for sustainable agriculture that is meeting the needs of the present while improving the ability of future generations to ne meet their needs. We leave the wood stack a little taller. It is the agricultural ethic. We start with a point of agreement that agriculture is not here just to, to maintain, but to make things better. That's what our producers do. It's the farm ethic in the United States, and we are going to persist with that. We say that key performance indicators should be science-based, outcomes-driven, technology-neutral, and transparent. Why? Because in the chaos of sustainability initiatives out there now, especially coming out of Europe, we have a whole range of key performance indicators that have nothing to do with outcomes, that have only to do with 
ideology, the size of the farm, um, biotechnology applications, uh, walk through the list and it's amazing the sorts of silliness you see embedded in these sustainability initiatives. We need to cut through the nonsense because we need to be more effective at driving the outcomes that we all agree. When I say we all, I'm, that means the retailers and the, uh, and the conservation organizations as well as the farmers agree are the most important things, supported by science. Key performance indicators are things we care about. I was in South Africa a year ago at the uh, World Food and Feed Congress and I got to go on a photo safari and I saw this mother giraffe walk up from the riparian zone. Uh, there's about five or six giraffes and a bunch of uh, gazelles and uh, zebras down in the riparian zone and they walked up and she put her head up, ears up and walked up to, uh, to this little ledge by a creek. Guess what the gazelles and zebras did? They skedaddled. They went the other way. They didn't stick around. Can you see what she's looking at? There are five lions in this belt, in the, in the bush here. Five lions. They're right over here. She saw the lions. They didn't. They didn't have to see the lions to make a directionally correct decision. Sometimes, as scientists, we overcomplicate the metrics. You don't have to see the lions to make a right decision. You don't have to say there are five lions. Run. You have to say, that zebra sees something. Run. All right? And if you don't make the right decision, what happens? So, environmental indicators are where we almost always start with sustainability because reality is they're the easiest. Well, economic are pretty easy too, but this is, this is where the conflict usually arises. So, th these are the, the, the key performance indicators field to market is adopted. Greenhouse gas, soil loss, uh, gr greenhouse gas emissions, soil loss, energy use, water use, land use, water quality, nutrient use, efficiency, habitat, biodiversity. These are the first tier five we started with and we, we're adding these now. We're trying to make these common across a number of U.S. initiatives, so we work on the same things together. This harmonization of activity makes us more efficient, more effective. It also allows us to communicate more clearly to the public and others what we're up to. When I work with farmers, I don't talk about greenhouse gas emissions first. I talk about energy use efficiency first. I talk about nitrogen use efficiency. Now, when we increase energy use efficiency and increase nitrogen use efficiency, we decrease greenhouse gas emissions and decrease N2O emissions and improve water quality. Why even go into those other metrics? If, the far if they are a threat to the farmer's framing, talk about what the farmer cares about first. When we talk with the World Wildlife Conservation, we show them that we're getting better at these. And we show them how. And we describe what's coming next and why. That's the science. Here's one of our challenges. This is a big challenge we have, is that everyone wants to solve everything all at once and they want to do it one farm at a time. There are 400,000 plus corn farmers and soybean farmers in the United States alone. One farm at a time isn't going to get us there. It's not going to move the curve. So if you look at soil erosion, soil erosion in the United States, and this is a, a crude estimate of 0.131 tons per bushel based on 2010 national average. I don't believe that number for a minute, but let's assume that that's because I think that our, our methods are relatively crude to estimate this, but the number is there. Let's assume that that's the number we have, and by using similar methods, we can evaluate if we get better or not, right? And the, the methods we're using are revised universal soil loss equation over the landscape. So for U.S. soybeans for 2010, that's our benchmark, and we have this distribution. A lot of farmers are a lot better than that. Here's where the problems are. Any of, us, you, any of you who work with statistics know that the tails drive the means, right? So here's what we have. So why are we focusing on these guys isn't this where we should focus? This is NRCS's history over the last 100 plus years of focusing on these guys. And that's what we do. But the rest of the world doesn't know it. I'll be in, in Paris with the, uh, the, Nash, with the uh, USDA in September explaining to European farmers what we do, and our European government people, what we do in US agriculture and why, because they don't believe it. We tell them these things, they don't believe it. So we have to show them and show them and show them. What we want to do is move the curve. If we, had, if we target BMP adoption at these folks, we move the curve, make things better, and that's the way we make a more sustainable world. It's hard slogging, and it's hard to communicate. I can't talk probability distribution functions to farmers very well. Actually, they're pretty sophisticated in understanding this. I sure as hell can't talk about this to congressmen. So that's a, that's a challenge we have. How do we talk about this? We talk about focusing on, on our priorities where they matter most. 
Field of Mark has done this with the field print calculator and, and a uh, benchmarking report that we do every uh, three to five years uh, where we evaluate these metrics and benchmark them and we show over time how we're getting better and where we're not getting better and what we need to do next to prioritization system that all the stakeholders that I showed you earlier are involved in. We also are working with our field print calculator, this is a case study in Nebraska, to evaluate in a given region how farmers are doing best to worst across these metrics and evaluate how we can move the curve in each region. Again, working with our conservation district partners, extension folks, and in our CS, this is, and now we've got our retailers and conservation organizations involved in this discussion. Let's take a few minutes to talk about goals. I uh, don't want to pull my phone out. Tell me what my time is. All right, good. I'm on track. Goals. Goals are important. How we set goals is critically important. In most sustainability initiatives, the goals are all in one bucket. Everything from prescriptive production practices and higher ethics, don't, uh, don't beat your employees with a chain, to uh, metrics for soil health. And they're all in the same place. And there's no hierarchy to them. There's no structure organization. We're suggesting that goals should be, that aspirational and strategic goals belong to the multi-stakeholder initiative. This is where everyone in the, in the room, everyone in the supply chain, everyone who eats should have a voice. And we should agree on what the most important goals are. This dashed line is a brick wall. Below that, tactical and operational goals, how you achieve these goals belongs to the management, the enterprise, the farmer. We should never prescribe to the farmer how to farm, ever. The producer how to produce, ever. The processor how to process, ever. Because that kills initiative. That, kill, that just means compliance. That kills innovation. We need, everything's changing too fast. We don't need to freeze anything except for the footprint of ag. We need to expand our technology. So aspirational goals are directionally correct. We're going to reduce greenhouse gases. We're going to increase soil health. Strategic goals have numbers and time associated with them. We're going to reduce greenhouse gas from soybeans by 25% in 20 years. We're going to increase soil organic carbon in cornfields 15% in 10 years. Those are goals we can agree on, strategic and tactical. I'm sorry, aspirational and strategic. How we get there belongs to the, com the management community. I've been working with the United States Soybean Export Council on their sustainability assurance protocol to, and the uh, USB has adopted a suite of benchmarks based upon key performance indicators. Um, I presume these slides will be available to folks after the meeting, so you guys can refer to these or email me if you have any questions. But the key is that they also adopted goals for each of these key performance indicators. For four KPIs, adopted goals for, the, for uh, 2025. 10% reduction in land use per, per unit of, uh, per bushel, which means a yield efficiency increase. 25% reduction in soil erosion, 10% increase in the energy use efficiency, and 10% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. They have committed to these goals, working with, of course, our NRCS and, US, uh, and uh, conservation districts, uh, our infrastructure uh, across the nation to develop this. And they're in the process of developing tactical strategies for checkoff dollars to achieve these goals. This is continuous improvement at work. Now, I've got a couple of slides here on, uh, on the benchmarking work we've done with, uh, with Greg Toma and, and our Arkansas team on, on animal ag, uh, carbon footprinting for swine, etc. I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and flip through these fast, not for you to see them, because, uh, but mainly to say we see the same thing that Al has seen with his work with dairy. It's the same basic uh, uh, same basic distribution of impacts for greenhouse gases, uh, live animal production, manure, feed, and piglets. That's where the, the action is. Uh, we looked at management strategies from anesthesia, use of ractomamine, immunocastration, growth promoting microbe, antimicrobials, taking them out, taking out preventive antimicrobials, etc. What we find, by the way, is if we take anti preventative antimicrobials out of the, the equation in production, we increase uh, greenhouse gas per production because of piglet mortality. Uh, we benchmarked water. What we find is that most of the water in, the, in, the, in pork is in the, the ration, same as Al found with dairy, uh, and that on-farm drinking water is a big chunk of, of where the water goes. These are no, not surprises either. And we also found that we will increase water consumption significantly if we take preventative antimicrobials out of the equation for production. These are decisions we need to make. These are management decisions we're being stressed with, but we'd better have the data and understand the consequences. 
So this process of continuous improvement is what we're advocating. This process is what we're using across almost every ag sector in the United States. It's a process that we are advocating for Europe as well. Uh, this process is in review as, as standard X629 by ASABE, Framework for Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, it's in committee review, will be go, out, go out for public review in three weeks as an ANSI standard. So we'll have an ANSI standard citable for producers, for, for uh, grower groups, for this Framework for Sustainable Agriculture. Thank you. Cowards. Thanks, Marty, for a great presentation. Um, so about 20 years ago, when people started to talk about sustainable systems, there was this resiliency factor that uh, systems have to be resilient to perturbations in climate. And, and this was even before climate change came on or so um, is that not, I mean, I haven't heard anybody this morning talk about resilient systems. Um, I was going to ask Al, um, you know, could we vary uh, climate or weather patterns and come up with systems that seem to be most resilient to these great perturbations in climate? So where does resiliency come in? It's a great question. What I would, when I have this discussion with producer groups, Resiliency is the framing. That you don't do sustainability because Walmart or World Wildlife Fund wants you to. You do it because your producers need to be more, more resilient. They need to be able to weather change. Change is coming. We're living through change right now, and the change is only going to amplify. Uh, we're only going to see increased amp uh, amplitude and in increased frequency of change. So we had better be able to adapt to that rapidly or weather it, resiliency. So that's a framing issue. The general public doesn't understand that. Most CEOs do get that a little bit uh, from the consumer packaged good companies. When I talk to them, it's framing their supply chain. You need a resilient supply chain. You need to be able to put branded products on the shelf. And if you don't have a resilient supply chain, that is, if you don't understand where your stuff's coming from and how it's produced, you're going to be at risk of not being able to put your product on the shelf. You won't have peanuts for peanut M&Ms, for example, if you don't understand those things. So that's the sort of uh, discussion framing that's critical. The challenge is keeping the message simple enough that it's digestible in a 30-second soundbite. Resiliency starts to add complexity. It's an appropriate framing in an appropriate context where you have time to get into it. So, Marty, how, does your framework address the issue of, say, for example, a Central Valley uh, dairy needing or perhaps should be prioritizing VOCs versus, I'll say, an eastern, northeastern dairy that is, should be, have uh, phosphorus runoff to be a major concern. How does, how does your... The, the framework of goal setting. Goal setting occurs at multiple scales. It should occur at local, regional, and national scales. National goals are, if we think about aspirational and strategic goals, there, should, there are national goals. But then there are local goals, too. Local priorities. Local priorities drive decision making. We all understand that. That's really where the farmer lives. Uh, watershed level for water quality almost always, airshed and eco region for other things. So understanding that scale or impact is critical, but that goal setting process must be done in a multi-stakeholder environment to have legitimacy. People need to understand how the goals were developed. They need to have a voice in setting those goals at this highest, that highest level for them to have legitimacy and for us to communicate that message. When we can say that we, the producers of Central Valley, the Bosque River, watershed, pick your place, have worked with our stakeholders, the people who live here and the people who have a, 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 an interest and in, are affected by these decisions to come up with these goals and they understand what we're doing and how and why and we're reporting back to them and you on, a, on a, this frequency on our effectiveness of achieving those goals. Now you have a legitimate process for continuous improvement. If you don't have that discussion, then it's you doing something behind the veil and nobody understands it and I can guarantee you they won't trust it. But yes, local is an important scale issue. Thank you, folks. Well, thank you, Dr. Matlock and uh, all our speakers. Uh, I was uh, personally very pleased by the, uh, today's
conversation and uh, the presentations, and hopefully you uh, gain from them as well. A couple of quick things, uh, get you turned loose to get ready for the, the tour tours. Uh, we have a really nice Pebble Beach uh, unclaimed umbrella up here that I'm going to take home with me if nobody claims it. Um, so if it's yours, oh, we have a winner. <clears throat> Uh, also, a quick reminder that tonight, after the tours, uh, beginning at about 7 o'clock, is the poster session and reception. Uh, there will be good food, uh, and should make a meal, and there will be uh, students there who are uh, doing some really good work, and it's, it's kind of rare to get students, graduate students, um, interested in extension careers and, and the type of work that we do, so uh, uh, really appreciate you uh, spending some time with them and looking over their posters. And then um, finally, it's just another good uh, opportunity to have some networking. So at this point, we're going to turn you loose. Uh, there should be box launches, I've been told. Uh, I, I saved the microphone, so don't take it out of me. But I'm guaranteed that there's the box launches out there. Grab one. Uh, you'll be able to eat it on, on the bus. Uh, uh, that would probably be the easiest place to do it. Uh, at 12.30, the first bus will start um, heading out for the digester tour, and then they'll ramp up after that. So please be in the lobby down by the valley, valet area where we got on the buses last night. So thank you. Uh, the evaluations, if you filled out evaluation forms or surveys, uh, I'd drop them off at the registration desk. <laughs>